Hi, I'm Carl Weber. Welcome to Video Aided Instructions English Grammar Series. This is the Sentence Structure Program. You know, language is one of the most complicated human behaviors. Virtually every human being learns to use language by the time they're two or three years old. And everyone uses language every day in one way or another, either in speaking, in reading, or in writing. Therefore, everyone influences how language is used. They influence how language is spoken, heard, written, and understood. Therefore, the study of language is one of the most complicated of all subjects, and almost any grammar rule or rule about how to use language correctly is bound to have exceptions. In this program, we'll focus on the least you need to know. In other words, we'll try to take the complicated subject of grammar and make it easy for you. What we want to do is provide you with the rules and information that you need to communicate in English clearly, effectively, and correctly. Everyone is able to convey their meaning eventually. No one has ever starved to death because they weren't able to convey the fact that they were hungry. But some forms of language are more likely to please, to impress, and to influence other people. And therefore, using correct grammar and being able to express yourself properly is going to be more effective in your everyday life. It's a little bit like using proper table manners or dressing appropriately. It's not strictly necessary, but it's a very good idea. In addition, knowing and using the proper rules of English grammar will enable you to score higher on tests of English and to do better in school. So for all these reasons, studying and learning the basics of English grammar is also very important for anyone who is studying English as a second language. With that in mind, let's begin this program dealing with sentence structure. Let's begin by discussing what is a sentence. A sentence is a group of words that expresses a complete thought. You can contrast a sentence with a sentence fragment. A sentence fragment is a kind of mistake that people sometimes make in writing English. A sentence fragment is a group of words that doesn't express a complete thought. Now, sentence fragments are often used when people are casually speaking to one another. But a sentence fragment is considered a mistake in writing. Here's the reason. A sentence fragment, a group of words that doesn't express a complete thought by itself, may be clear in a conversation because people are talking back and forth and this context gives meaning to the sentence fragment. In writing, however, there is no conversation to give a context and therefore to explain the meaning of the sentence fragment. So a sentence fragment which might be clear in conversation is not clear in writing. That's why when you're writing English, you want to write in complete sentences, not in sentence fragments. Consider, for example, this group of words. Out to lunch. Is this a sentence or a sentence fragment? Well, it's a sentence fragment because it doesn't express a complete thought. Out to lunch doesn't tell us who is out to lunch or explain what the meaning of those words out to lunch really is. The words out to lunch could become part of a complete sentence, of course. You could say, Susan and I are going out to lunch. Or, Frank was out to lunch when I visited his office. Now we have a complete thought and therefore a complete sentence. But by themselves, the words out to lunch are a fragment rather than a complete sentence. Or consider these words, maybe later. Is this a sentence or a sentence fragment? Again, it's a sentence fragment. The words maybe later by themselves don't express a complete thought. Now you could imagine having a conversation in which someone would say, maybe later, in answer to a question. In a conversation, a sentence fragment like this can be meaningful and can be understood. For example, you might say to someone, 
Oh, do you feel like having a bite of lunch right now? And your friend might answer, maybe later. In the context of the conversation, you can understand what the sentence fragment means. But if the words, maybe later, appeared by themselves in a piece of writing, you probably wouldn't understand what the words were referring to. That's what makes it a sentence fragment, and therefore incorrect in writing. So writing in English must consist of complete sentences. In writing, a sentence always begins with a capital letter. That's one of the larger letters that stands out on the page and indicates, in English, the beginning of a sentence. A sentence always ends with a punctuation mark. And there are a few different choices for punctuation marks that you can use to end a sentence. The most common punctuation mark to use to end a sentence is a period. The alternative choices are a question mark or an exclamation point. In a moment, we'll explain exactly how you would decide whether to use a period, a question mark, or an exclamation point to mark the end of a sentence. But in any case, the punctuation mark is necessary at the end of the sentence because it makes it easy for the reader to see when one sentence ends and the next one begins. Now, in English, there are four main kinds of sentences. Declarative sentences, interrogative sentences, exclamatory sentences, and imperative sentences. Let's define each one and look at an example. A declarative sentence states a fact. Take a look at this example. The sun is shining today. This sentence states a fact about what today's weather is like. Therefore, it's a declarative sentence. The vast majority of English sentences that you'll encounter in reading and writing are declarative sentences. Notice that this sentence begins with a capital letter and ends with a period. Almost all declarative sentences end with periods. And again, this is the most common type of sentence that you're likely to encounter or that you'll be writing for school or for work. An interrogative sentence asks a question. Do you have any plans for this afternoon? When I say this interrogative sentence, I'm asking a question of whoever is listening to me. I'm asking them what they're planning to do this afternoon. An interrogative sentence ends with a question mark. That makes it clear to the reader that a question is being asked. And again, like all sentences, it begins with a capital letter. The third type of sentence is an exclamatory sentence. An exclamatory sentence expresses a strong emotion. Look at this example. What a beautiful day for a picnic. Maybe you could tell from the way I read that sentence aloud that I'm expressing a strong emotion or a strong feeling about what beautiful weather we have today. This makes it an, ex an exclamatory sentence. And it ends with, an exclamation point. This is a special mark of punctuation that's used to indicate to the reader that strong emotions or feelings are being expressed in the sentence. The fourth type of sentence is an imperative sentence. An imperative sentence makes a request or gives an order. The person who hears an imperative sentence is being required to do something. Look at this example. Come with me. This is an imperative sentence because I'm inviting the person who hears the sentence to do something, namely, to come with me. An imperative sentence may end with a period or with an exclamation point. It all depends on how uh, forceful the request or command or order is intended to be. A command or order which is given with a great deal of emotion and feeling and forcefulness might be ended with an exclamation point. Otherwise, a period will do. In this example, we've used an exclamation point to indicate that strong feelings are behind the invitation, come with me. These then are the four types of sentences. A declarative sentence, an interrogative sentence, an exclamatory sentence, and an imperative sentence. In most writing, declarative sentences are by far the most common. Interrogative sentences come second most uh, frequent, 
And exclamatory and imperative sentences are very, very rare in writing. They're often used in speaking and conversation, but rarely in writing. So for the purposes of English grammar, as it affects your work and school use of English, the declarative and interrogative sentences are the most important. In your study guide, we've provided you with some exercises which will help to reinforce and allow you to practice the information and skills that we're covering in this program. Turn to your study guide now and go to the first exercise there, which deals with this topic of what is a sentence and the four types of sentences. Did you find this exercise difficult? Your job was to read five sentences and for each one to decide whether the sentence was a declarative sentence, an interrogative sentence, an exclamatory sentence, or an imperative sentence. We also threw in one sentence fragment, that is, a group of words that looks like a sentence but doesn't express a complete thought. Remember that in writing, a sentence fragment is incorrect. Let's look at the first sentence. When will tomorrow morning's band rehearsal begin? Perhaps you can tell by reading this sentence that it is asking a question. Therefore, this is an interrogative sentence, and it needs to end with a question mark. So that's the correct answer for this first question. Let's look at the second sentence. Always read the safety instructions before using a new power tool. What kind of sentence is this? Is it a declarative sentence? Does it state a fact? No, not really. Is it an interrogative sentence? Is it asking a question of you, the hearer? No, it isn't. Is it an exclamatory sentence? Is it expressing strong emotion? No, not really that either. It is an imperative sentence. Remember, an imperative sentence is one that makes a request or gives an order. And in this case, the sentence is giving an order or making a request of whoever reads it. It is telling that person that they ought to do something, namely to read the safety instructions before using a new power tool. Therefore, this is an imperative sentence. Remember that we said an imperative sentence may end with either a period or an exclamation point. It all depends on whether strong feeling or strong emotion is being expressed. In this case, no particularly strong emotion. And therefore, the correct way to end this sentence would be with a period. Let's look at our next example. Having spent over two hours working on her dance routine, could you tell that this is the sentence fragment? This is a sentence fragment because it doesn't express a complete thought. There are a lot of words here, and we can see that someone spent over two hours working on her dance routine, but we can't really tell what's going on because it doesn't say who spent two hours on her dance routine. Therefore, the person who is doing the action is missing from this sentence, and what results is not a complete thought. We don't really understand what the person who wrote this sentence is trying to convey. This is a sentence fragment, not a complete sentence. And if it appeared in a piece of writing, it would be considered incorrect. Therefore, this is the sentence fragment and shouldn't be given any final punctuation because it's really not a complete sentence. Let's look at the next example. The local wildlife refuge is home to over 70 species of birds. This sentence states a fact. Therefore, it's a declarative sentence, the most common type of sentence in English and it ought to be concluded with a simple period. Let's look at the final sentence. That was a fabulous party. Here is a sentence that expresses strong emotion. This is an exclamatory sentence. It ought to be marked with a, an exclamation point, which indicates that it's a sentence expressing strong feelings. The person who wrote or speaks this sentence is talking about how much they enjoyed the party, and is expressing that with a lot of feeling. That's what makes this an exclamatory sentence and means that it should end with an exclamation point. Did you get all five of these questions right? I hope so. Now we're ready to move on to lesson two.
Now we know what a sentence is, and we also know what the four basic kinds of sentences are. But let's take a step back. Remember that the topic for this program is sentence structure. Now structure refers to the way anything is constructed or built or made. For example, a house is a structure that's made out of wood, bricks, and other materials. What is a sentence constructed from? Well, of course, the most basic unit is the word. But before we talk about individual words, we need to talk about some of the bigger parts that go to make up the structure of a sentence. In particular, there are two big parts into which most sentences can be divided. These two main parts are the subject and the predicate. Let's talk about each in a little more detail. The subject tells what the sentence is talking about. Now, the subject of a sentence may be only one word long, or it may include a number of words. In any case, the single most important word in the subject is the simple subject. The other words in the subject are there to give more information about the simple subject. And we'll see an example in a moment. The subject, then, is one part of the sentence, and the rest of the sentence, whatever is not part of the subject, is considered part of the predicate, which is the other main building block of a sentence. The predicate describes something that the subject is or does. The most important word in the predicate is called the verb. A verb is a word that expresses action or state of being. So we now have two main parts to the sentence. We have the subject, which names what the sentence is talking about, and the predicate, which tells what the subject is or does. Once again, within the predicate, there is one most important word to focus on, which is called the verb, and all the other words that are in the predicate are there to give more information about what the subject does. Let's take a look at a couple of examples of sentences and see how they can be divided into subject and predicate. Look at this example. My younger sister, Ingrid, once worked as a costume designer. Let's begin by looking for the subject of this sentence. Is there a word or a group of words that explains what the sentence is talking about? Yes, in this case, the first four words of the sentence make up the subject. Those four words tell us what the sentence is about. The sentence is about my younger sister, Ingrid. Is there one word within that subject which is the most important word, the word that tells you specifically what the sentence is about? Yes, it's the last word, Ingrid. So Ingrid is the simple subject of this sentence. The other words in the subject are there to give more information about the simple subject. So the words, my younger sister, are there to give more information about Ingrid. They tell us a little bit more about who Ingrid is. Okay, if the first four words of this sentence are the subject, then the rest of the sentence must be the predicate. Remember that the predicate describes something that the subject is or does. Do the other words in this sentence describe something that Ingrid is or does? Yes, they describe something that Ingrid did at one time, once worked as a costume designer. All of that is the predicate of the sentence. Notice how the subject and the predicate work together to express a complete thought. Either one by itself would be a sentence fragment. My younger sister Ingrid couldn't stand alone as a sentence. That's a sentence fragment. It doesn't express a complete thought. Once worked as a costume designer would also be a sentence fragment. Those words also don't express a complete thought by themselves, but when you combine the subject and the predicate, a complete thought is expressed. Now, is there one most important word in the predicate that tells exactly what Ingrid does, or in this case, did, because it's talking about something from the past? Yes, there is one word that is most important in the predicate. It's the word worked. Worked is the verb in this sentence, and it's the most important word. It tells us exactly what Ingrid did. She worked. Notice that all the other words in the predicate give us more information about what Ingrid did. The word once, for example, tells us when she did it. 
at one time in the past. And the words, as a costume designer, give us more information about exactly how she worked, what kind of job she worked at. So all the other words in the predicate are there to give us more information about what Ingrid did. But the word worked is the most important word. It's the verb. So the heart of this sentence is the subject and the predicate, and in particular, the one word simple subject and the verb. Ingrid worked. And all the other words in the subject and the predicate are there to give us more information about how and when and at what Ingrid worked. Let's take a look at another example. She enjoys creating things with her hands. Can you identify the subject in this sentence? In this case, the subject is only one word long, she. That word all by itself tells us who or what the sentence is about. All the rest of the sentence is the predicate. It tells us what the subject is or does. The rest of the sentence enjoys creating things with her hands tells us something about what the subject does. The subject, she, one word long, and therefore the subject and the simple subject are exactly the same. Focusing on the predicate for a moment, is there one word there that's most important? The verb, which tells us exactly what the subject does. Yes, the verb, the most important word in the predicate is enjoys. That tells us exactly what the subject, she, does. She enjoys. And the other words in the predicate tell us more information about what she enjoys. She enjoys creating things. And how does she create them? With her hands. So all the other words in the predicate give us more information about exactly what the subject does. But enjoys is the most important word in the predicate. It's the verb. Again, the heart of this sentence is she enjoys. And the other words, the remaining words in the predicate, are there to give more information. In this particular sentence, then, we have a very short subject, and the rest of the sentence, the predicate, tells us what the subject does. Now, occasionally, this kind of simple sentence structure gets a little more complicated with the addition of a compound subject. What is a compound subject? A compound subject is two or more things that work together as the subject. Usually, these two or more things are joined together by the word and or the word or. Look at this example. Dogs and cats sometimes enjoy living together. What's the subject of this sentence? Well, the subject of this sentence is the first three words, dogs and cats. That's what the sentence is about. All the rest is the predicate. It tells what dogs and cats do. Now, what's the simple subject of this sentence? Is it dogs? Is it cats? Well, really, it's both. The sentence isn't only about dogs, and it's not only about cats. It's about both. And since we have two subjects that are joined by the word and, we would consider this a compound subject. So the entire subject is both words and the word and between them. Dogs and cats all together go to make up the subject as well as the simple subject. In this case, a compound subject exists in this sentence. Looking for a moment at the predicate of this sentence, sometimes enjoy living together. Is there one most important word that expresses exactly what the dogs and cats do? The word is enjoy. That's the verb in this sentence, the most important word in the predicate, and it tells us what the dogs and cats do. They enjoy. And the other words in the predicate tell us more about exactly what they enjoy. They enjoy living together. And when they do it? Just as a subject can be compound, a verb can also be compound. When a subject is, is compound, it means that there are two or more things that are acting together in the sentence. Can you guess what a compound verb would be? Well, that's when you have a subject which is doing two or more things. A compound verb is two or more verbs that describe what the subject does. Again, joined by the word and or or. Here's an example. The giant tree bent and swayed in the wind. What's the subject in this sentence? The answer is the giant tree. That's what the sentence is about. Is there a one word simple subject? Yes, it's the word tree. The other words, 
the giant, are there to tell you more about the tree, to describe it a little bit. Now, the rest of the sentence is the predicate, bent and swayed in the wind. Now, is there a most important word in the predicate, a word that tells you exactly what the tree did? Well, the fact is, there are two words that tell you two things that the tree did. It bent, but it also swayed. So those two words, bent and swayed, are both equally important. They're both verbs. They both describe actions that the tree took, and they're connected by the word and. So in this sentence, we have a compound verb. That is, two verbs joined by the word and, both of which describe what the subject is doing. So the heart of this sentence is tree, bent, and swayed. And the other words in the sentence are there to give us more information about what kind of tree it was and how and when the tree bent and swayed. So as we see in some sentences, you may have a compound subject, that is, two or more subjects joined by the word and or or. And in some sentences, you may have a compound verb, that is, two or more verbs joined by the word and or or. You may even have, in certain sentences, both a compound subject and a compound verb. But most often, one or the other will be compound and not both. We've seen then that every sentence can be broken down into two main parts, the subject and the predicate. The subject expresses who or what the sentence is about, and one word from the subject, the simple subject, is the most important word in the subject. The rest of the sentence is the predicate. It tells what the subject is or does. And the most important word in the predicate is the verb. In your study guide, we have an exercise that will give you a chance to practice your understanding of these concepts. In this exercise, your job was to look at each sentence and decide which group of words was the subject and which group of words was the predicate. Then within the subject, you were to identify the most important word, which is the simple subject, and within the predicate, to identify the most important word, which would be the verb. Let's take a look at each of the sentences and see how well you did. First, 53 officers received medals at the police department awards ceremony. What's the subject of this sentence? Who or what is the sentence about? It's the first two words, 53 officers. That is who the sentence is about. And the simple subject, the most important word here is officers. The other word, 53, gives us more information about the officers. Specifically, it tells us how many officers there were. So 53 officers is the subject and officers is the simple subject. That means the rest of the sentence would be the predicate. Were you able to identify the single most important word, namely the verb? That's the word that expresses the action that the officers did. The answer to that is received. Received is the verb in this sentence. It tells us what the officers did. They received something. All the rest of the predicate gives us more information about what the officers did. What did they receive? Medals. Where did they receive them? At the police department awards ceremony. So all those other words in the predicate are there to give us more information about the action they did, namely the receiving. Let's take a look at the second sentence. Bored with the grown-up conversation, little Amy fell asleep under the kitchen table. Where would you divide this sentence between the subject and the predicate? In this case, the subject includes all the words up to little Amy. So the subject would include, bored with the grown-up conversation, little Amy. All of that is the subject. All of that describes what the sentence is about, or in this case, who the sentence is about. What's the single most important word here? Did you identify one word as the simple subject? The answer is Amy. Amy is the simple subject. That's basically what the sentence is about. All the other words here give us more information about Amy. The other words tell us that Amy is little and that she was bored with the grown-up conversation. So all those other words give more information about the simple subject, Amy. 
The rest of the sentence is the predicate. Fell asleep under the kitchen table. Which word is the verb, the most important word in the predicate? The answer is fell. What did Amy do? She fell. The rest of the words in the predicate give us more information, specifically that she didn't fall off a ledge or off a sofa. She fell asleep. And where did she fall asleep? Under the kitchen table. So the subject is bored with the grown-up conversation, little Amy, and the predicate is fell asleep under the kitchen table. And fell is the most important word in the predicate, the verb. How about the next example? The number of businesses in this county has increased every year for the past decade. The subject of this sentence is the number of businesses in this county. All of those words go to explain what the sentence is about. Now, picking the simple subject in this sentence isn't so easy. It's a little bit tricky in this case. Is the sentence about businesses or this county? No, it's really about number. The word number is actually the simple subject of this sentence. One way to tell for sure is that that word, that simple subject, is the word that is most directly connected to the predicate. Let's look at the predicate. The predicate is the rest of the sentence, which Every says, for the past decade. Now remember, the predicate tells us what the subject of the sentence does. Now, looking at this sentence, what has increased every year for the past decade? In other words, what does the predicate refer to? What is it that has increased every year for the past decade? Is it the county that has increased? No, the county hasn't increased. Is it businesses has increased? No, not really. What has increased is the number of businesses. In other words, the number was smaller at one time, now the number is larger. Perhaps the number of businesses was 50, now it's 100. The point is that the number has increased or gotten larger. So the simple subject here is the word number. It may be difficult to recognize because it's not at the end of the complete subject. It's somewhere buried in the middle and it's easy to overlook that. But the most important word in this particular subject is the word number and you can tell that because that's the word that's most directly connected to the predicate. Looking at the predicate, what's the most important word there, or the verb? Once again, this example is a little more tricky than some of the other examples we've seen. In this case, the verb consists of two words. Sometimes, verbs in English do consist of two or even more words. In this case, the verb includes both the word has and the word increased. You need both of those words to make the complete verb to explain uh, what the number of businesses in this county has done. The number has increased. You need both of those words to make up the verb. Notice that this is not a compound verb because these are not two separate verbs, two separate actions joined by the word and or or. Instead, these are simply two words that fit together to make a single verb describing a single action, has increased. It simply happens to be a verb that is made up of two words rather than just one. So in this case, the verb is has increased. And those two words together make up the verb, which is the most important word in our predicate. Next example. According to scientists, birds and dinosaurs are biologically related. Where would we divide the subject and the predicate in this case? In this sentence, the subject is everything up through the word dinosaurs. So the subject is, according to scientists, birds and dinosaurs. The rest of the sentence is the predicate. It tells us what the subject is or does. Are biologically related. Now let's go back to the subject. What's the simple subject here? Do you notice anything unusual about it? In this case, we have a compound subject because there are two subjects, both equally important, connected by the word and birds and dinosaurs. So those two words together with the word and connecting them make up the simple subject in this particular sentence. Looking at the predicate, what's the most important word, the verb in this predicate? The verb is are. What the sentence is about is something that birds and dinosaurs are. 
And all the remaining words in the sentence give more information about that. They tell us where this information comes from, namely scientists, and they tell us what the birds and dinosaurs are. They are biologically related. Our last example, all day and all night unceasingly fell the rain. This sentence may sound a little bit unusual to you, and it's written in a slightly unusual English style. It almost sounds a little bit poetic, and we put it in for a specific reason. Where would you find the subject in this particular sentence? Well, this sentence is different from all the other sentences we've looked at so far because the subject is at the end of the sentence. In most English sentences, the subject comes at the beginning. But once in a while, you'll encounter an English sentence where the subject comes at the end. And often, it has a slightly unusual sound, as this sentence does. In this case, when we ask who or what is the sentence about, we say it's about the rain. So those last two words of the sentence, the rain, are the subject. And the simple subject is the one word, rain. The rest of the sentence is the predicate. It tells what the rain did. And what did the rain do? All day and all night unceasingly fell. What's the single most important word in the predicate? The verb, which tells us exactly what the rain did. The verb is fell. So the heart of this sentence is rain fell. And all the other words give us a little more information about that. Obviously, we threw this sentence into the mix to illustrate for you that the subject isn't always at the beginning of the sentence. But in most English sentences, it is. So when you're looking for the subject of a sentence, start by looking at the beginning. The chances are good that that's where it is. But if you don't find it there, stop and think. Perhaps this is one of those unusual sentences where the subject appears at the end. And this is an example of that. So far in this program, we've been talking about sentences. Now I'm about to introduce a new word for a reason which will soon become apparent. This new word is clause. And here's the definition. A clause is a group of words that includes both a subject and a verb. Now you may be thinking, gee, that sounds an awful lot like a sentence. Because after all, all the sentences we've looked at up to this point do contain both subjects and verbs. So how is a clause different from a sentence? Well, that will become obvious in a moment. Let me explain that there are two kinds of clauses. One of them is the same as a sentence, and the other is not. But it's important to understand both kinds of clauses because larger and more complicated sentence structures may involve both kinds of clauses. Here's how it works. The first kind of clause is an independent clause. An independent and clause as a one. sentence. Why? Because it expresses a complete thought. You know the word independent means able to stand on one's own. When the United States became independent from the country that founded it, England, the United States was able to stand on its own. And an independent clause can stand on its own as a sentence. Take a look at this example. Europa is one of the moons of Jupiter. Now, this is a clause because it's a group of words that contains both a subject and a verb. Can you identify the subject and the verb in this sentence? The subject is Europa. Europa is what the sentence is about. The verb is is. That is what Europa is or does in this sentence. It is something. And the rest of the words tell us what Europa is, one of the moons of Jupiter. So this is a clause because it contains both a subject and a verb. It's also a sentence because this happens to be an independent clause, a clause that is able to stand alone as a sentence because it expresses a complete thought. Well, if an independent clause can stand alone as a sentence, what do you call a clause that cannot stand alone as a sentence? The answer is a subordinate clause. The word subordinate means following or less important than, and this describes what these clauses are like. A subordinate clause can't stand alone as a sentence because it doesn't express a complete thought. 
Usually, subordinate clauses begin with particular types of words which are known as subordinating conjunctions. A conjunction is a word that connects two groups of words, and the word subordinating means making something less important. So a subordinating conjunction is a word that connects the subordinate clause to the rest of the sentence and makes the subordinate clause less important. Because the subordinating conjunction is present, the subordinate clause can't stand alone as a sentence. Here are some examples of subordinating conjunctions. If, after, because, since, although, when, until. Normally, a clause that begins with one of these words, one of these subordinating conjunctions, can't stand alone as a sentence because it won't express a complete thought. Therefore, we consider it a subordinate clause. Take a look at this example. Because Europa has oceans filled with water like the Earth. Now, this is a clause because it does contain a subject and a verb. The subject is Europa. The verb is has. So far, so good. But can this stand alone as a sentence? No. I think if you listen to this group of words, you can see that the clause doesn't express a complete thought. It says, because Europa has oceans filled with water like the Earth. This leaves you wondering what the speaker is getting at. Because Europa has oceans filled with water, therefore what? We're waiting for some conclusion. It sounds as though the sentence is leading to some conclusion, but none is presented. And therefore, this isn't a complete sentence. Rather, it's a subordinate clause, one that cannot stand alone as a sentence. And if this were to appear in a piece of writing as if it were a complete sentence, that would be a mistake. This is really a sentence fragment. This is a subordinate clause because it begins with the subordinating conjunction because. Notice that having the subordinating conjunction because there makes this into a subordinate clause. If you were to take away that subordinating conjunction, the sentence would become an independent clause. It could stand alone as a sentence. The sentence would then say, Europa has oceans filled with water like the Earth. Now that sounds like a complete thought. But when you put the subordinating conjunction because in front of it, it makes the clause less important. It makes it feel as though it needs to be attached to something else in order to express a complete thought. So this is the second type of clause. An independent clause can stand alone as a sentence. A subordinate clause cannot. And a subordinate clause usually begins with a subordinating conjunction. Now, why is it important to know about subordinate clauses? Because subordinate clauses are an important building block in many sentences. In fact, there are four different kinds of sentence structures that you need to know about. And subordinate clauses are important in some of them. The four types of sentence structures that you need to understand are the simple sentence, the compound sentence, the complex sentence, and the compound complex sentence. Let's take a look at each. First, a simple sentence. A simple sentence consists of one independent clause. Remember, an independent clause can stand alone as a sentence. And when it does, the result is what we call a simple sentence. For example, life may exist on Europa. This simple sentence contains the subject, life, the verb, which has two words, may exist, and taken together it is one clause, one independent clause, and therefore a simple sentence. By contrast, a compound sentence contains two or more independent clauses, which are joined either by a comma and a coordinating conjunction or a semicolon. That's a complicated definition, so let's take it piece by piece. A compound sentence contains two or more independent clauses. As we've seen, an independent clause can stand alone as a sentence, but two of them can also be joined together to form a compound sentence. Now, when you have two independent clauses and you want to join them together, you have to do it according to certain rules. 
And there are basically two alternatives, two ways of making that connection. One way of making the connection is by using a comma and a coordinating conjunction. There are a few different words that are called coordinating conjunctions. The most important and common ones are and, or, and but. So one way of joining two independent clauses to create a compound sentence is by using a comma and the word and, or, or but. Another way of connecting two independent clauses to make a compound sentence is by using a semicolon in between them. Let's take a look at an example of a compound sentence. Many astronomers believe in extraterrestrial life, but others disagree. Here we have two independent clauses which have been joined together to form a single compound sentence. The first independent clause is, many astronomers believe in extraterrestrial life. The word extraterrestrial means life outside of this planet, outside of the Earth. That could stand alone as a sentence. It's an independent clause. It contains the subject, astronomers, and the verb, believe. And it could stand alone as a sentence. Then we have the clause, but others disagree. That could also stand alone as a sentence. It contains the subject, others, the verb, disagree. And uh, the word, but, tells you that there's a contrast to the preceding idea. Nonetheless, it could stand alone as a sentence. It's perfectly all right to begin a sentence with a word like but or and. In any case, this is another independent clause. So this could have been set up as two separate sentences. But because the ideas are closely connected, the writer wanted to link them. How did he do it? By using a comma and the coordinating conjunction but. Putting that comma and the word but in there makes it easy to connect the two clauses to form one sentence, namely a compound sentence, because it's made up of two independent clauses. Now remember we said there's another way of creating a compound sentence, and that is to use a semicolon in place of the uh, comma and the coordinating conjunction. So this sentence would also be correct if it read as follows. Many astronomers believe in extraterrestrial life, semicolon, others disagree. This would also be a correct compound way of sentence. Creating. The point, a compound sentence consists of two independent clauses, and there are two alternative ways of joining them to make a single sentence. So that's our second type of sentence, simple sentence and a compound sentence. Now for the third type. A complex sentence contains an independent clause and one or more subordinate clauses. Now remember, the subordinate clause cannot stand alone as a sentence. However, it works perfectly well when it is attached to an independent clause. It normally has a secondary or less important meaning, and it needs the independent clause in order to express a complete thought. Let's take a look at an example of how this works. Here's a sentence. If extraterrestrial life is ever discovered, it will change human history. Now here we have two clauses. The first clause says, if extraterrestrial life is ever discovered. The subject of this clause is life. The verb is, is discovered. It's a two-word verb, and in this case, the word ever happens to come in between the two parts of the verb. That happens sometimes. So the subject and the verb is, life is discovered. And the whole clause reads, if extraterrestrial life is ever discovered. Now let's pause. Is that an independent clause or a subordinate clause? Could it stand alone as a sentence? Well, think about how it sounds. If extraterrestrial life is ever discovered, doesn't it leave you hanging? It leaves you wondering what the author is building toward. It sounds as though some conclusion is necessary. Therefore, we don't have a complete thought. We do have a subordinate clause. This is a clause that can't stand alone as a sentence. Let's take a look at the other clause and see what that is like. The other clause reads, it will change human history. This is a clause because it contains a subject and a verb. The subject is it, and will change is the verb. It will change human history. Now, could this clause stand alone as a sentence? 
Yes, it could. It expresses a complete thought. It will change human history. That could be a sentence by itself. So this is an independent clause. In this case, therefore, we have a subordinate clause first, followed by an independent clause. The two things work together to create a single complete thought. If extraterrestrial life is ever discovered, it will change human history. The first clause sets up a possibility, and the second clause explains what would happen if that possibility comes true. So the two clauses work together to express one complete idea. And therefore, we have a correct sentence, which is known as a complex sentence, because that's what a complex sentence does. It combines two different kinds of clauses, one an independent clause, and the other a subordinate clause, makes them into a whole to express a single thought. Notice that it doesn't matter what order the clauses are in. Uh, the subordinate clause could come first, or the independent clause could come first. In this particular sentence, the subordinate clause comes first, but it could have been the other way around. Either way, it's considered a complex sentence. The fourth and most difficult kind of sentence is known as the compound complex sentence. The compound complex sentence contains two or more independent clauses and one or more subordinate clauses. So it's like a combination of the compound sentence with the complex sentence. As you can see, the compound complex sentence must have at least three clauses. And some writers in English, um, uh, William Faulkner is a famous novelist who is a good example of this. Some writers in English write sentences that go on for many, many words, and in some cases, even a page or more. And some of the sentences in William Faulkner contain 10 or 12 or more separate clauses. Those are very complicated sentences, and their grammar is very difficult to untangle. But a compound complex sentence must contain at least three clauses. Let's take a look at an example, and we'll see how this works. Although no sign of life on other worlds has yet been found, the search continues, and many predict success. In this sentence, we have three groups of words, and each of these three is a clause, because each contains a subject and a verb. Let's take a look at each one. The first group of words says, although no sign of life on other worlds has yet been found. This is a clause because it contains a subject and a verb. The verb actually happens to be three words long. Has been found is the complete verb you need all three words to make up the verb in this case. The word yet, which is stuck in in the middle, happens to be an adverb. And adverbs do sometimes interrupt verbs in this way. But that isn't an important detail for right now. The verb is has been found, and the subject is sign. Sign has been found is the heart of this clause. Now, looking at the clause as a whole, is it an independent clause or a subordinate clause? Could it stand alone as a sentence? Well, the answer is no, it couldn't. Read it again. Although no sign of life on other worlds has yet been found. Perhaps you can hear that something is missing. The author seems to be building up to some conclusion, but no conclusion is presented. We can't tell what is supposed to happen as a result of the fact that no sign of life on other worlds has yet been found. We feel as though we're left hanging. Therefore, this clause doesn't express a complete thought, so it's a subordinate clause. The telltale sign, of course, is that it begins with a subordinating conjunction, although. Almost always, a clause that begins with the word although will be a subordinate clause and unable to stand alone as a sentence. What about the second clause? The next group of words in the sentence reads, the search continues. Here again, we have a subject and a verb, the verb is continues, and the subject is search. Could this stand alone as a sentence? Yes, it could. It expresses a complete thought. It sounds complete. And although it only consists of three words, nonetheless, it would make up a complete sentence by itself and could stand alone. The search continues. So here we have an independent clause. What about the last group of words in the sentence? And many predict success. Once again, this is a clause because it has a subject and a verb. The verb is predict, and the subject is many. 
Could this stand alone as a sentence? And many predict success. Yes, it could. This expresses a complete thought, and it could stand alone as a sentence. So now let's step back and look at what we have. We have a sentence consisting of three clauses. The first one is a subordinate clause. The second one is an independent clause. And the third one is another independent clause. That's what makes this a compound, complex sentence. Notice that the sentence is not terribly long or terribly complicated to understand. You probably didn't find it very difficult to understand what was being said in the sentence. Nonetheless, this is about as complicated from a grammatical standpoint as a sentence can get. Of the four types of sentences, the compound complex sentence is the most complicated type. So if you understand how this sentence is put together, you have a pretty good chance of understanding how any and all sentences are put together. The only difference when you get to a sentence written by someone like William Faulkner is that more and more clauses are piled on, but it just continues to be more of the same kind of thing, more of a compound complex sentence with more and more independent and subordinate clauses added on. Notice that as we've discussed these four types of sentences, the simple sentence, the compound sentence, the complex sentence, and the compound complex sentence, we've seen certain rules that apply to your own writing and to any academic work that you do related to English or grammar. We've seen that it's a mistake to let a subordinate clause stand alone as a sentence. When you do that, you create a sentence fragment, which is considered a grammatical error. Here's another type of grammatical error to watch out for. It's called the run-on sentence. Now, what is a run-on sentence? From the name of this error, that a run-on sentence is a sentence that is simply too long. Perhaps they figure that a sentence that's more than 50 words, let's say, is a run-on sentence. Well, a run-on sentence really has nothing to do with the length. There's a very simple definition of a run-on sentence, which should make it easy for you to avoid it in your own writing. A run-on sentence includes two or more independent clauses that are joined only by a comma or by nothing at all. Now let's stop and remember how we defined a compound sentence. Remember, a compound sentence contains two or more independent clauses. But when we discussed the compound sentence, we saw that there were two appropriate ways of connecting the two independent clauses. One way would be to use a comma and a coordinating conjunction, such as and, or, or but. The other correct way would be to use a semicolon. A run-on sentence comes about when two independent clauses are taken and simply jammed together with no punctuation between them or perhaps just a comma. Doing that makes an incorrect sentence it's a run-on. The connection between the two independent clauses is not clear, and it's considered a grammatical error. So if you have a teacher who says, you've made a mistake in your paper by writing a run-on sentence, this is what the teacher means. And you can see that the way to correct it is by following the proper rules for creating a compound sentence. Here's an example of a run-on sentence. Visit the City Science Museum, you'll see some fascinating exhibits about outer space. Here we have two clauses. Visit the City Science Museum. That's an independent clause, and it could stand alone as a sentence. Then we have another clause. You'll see some fascinating exhibits about outer space. What's the subject and the verb in each of these clauses, by the way? The first clause may be a little bit tricky. It has a verb, visit, but the subject doesn't appear. This is an uh, imperative clause, namely one that is giving you an order or a recommendation or a suggestion. And the subject doesn't appear normally in an imperative sentence. The subject is understood to be you. What this clause is saying is you visit the City Science Museum. So an imperative sentence is an exception to our rule that a subject and a verb must always appear. In an imperative sentence, the subject may be understood. In our second clause, the uh, subject is you, and the verb is will see. In this case, it takes the form of the contraction, apostrophe LL, instead of spelling out the word will at full length. 
but the words you'll see really mean the same as you will see. So in the second clause here, the verb is will see, and the subject is you. So we have two clauses here, either one of which could stand alone as a sentence. Look at that second clause. You'll see some fascinating exhibits about outer space. That could stand alone as a sentence. We have two independent clauses which have simply been stuck together with a comma in between. That's what makes this wrong. It's a run-on sentence. If you had written this in your own paper, you would have to correct it to make the paper grammatically acceptable. What would be a good way to fix this run-on sentence? Well, you have at least two options. Remember our rules about how to create a compound sentence. One way to correct this would be to use a comma and a coordinating conjunction. And in this case, the coordinating conjunction and seems like the natural choice. So the sentence would be correct if it read, visit the City Science Museum, comma, and you'll see some fascinating exhibits about outer space. Another way to correct the run-on sentence would be to substitute a semicolon for the comma. Then the sentence would read, visit the City Science Museum, semicolon, you'll see some fascinating exhibits about outer space. That would also be correct. There's another uh, program in this series that deals with punctuation, and we'll talk in more detail about the semicolon in that program. But for now, here's an important tip to remember. The purpose of the semicolon, basically, is to connect independent clauses. So whenever you use a semicolon in your writing, what appears on either side of the semicolon should be an independent clause, able to stand alone as a sentence. And if you put a semicolon in the middle of this longer sentence, you would create a correct compound sentence. The problem with it as it now reads is that it's a run-on because the two independent clauses have simply been stuck together with a comma, which does not work. Of course, there's really a third possible solution, which would be to make the two independent clauses into two separate sentences. Put a period in between and put a capital letter at the beginning of the second sentence and you'd be fine. So a run-on sentence can easily be corrected, but you must remember the rules for properly creating a compound sentence. To reinforce the skills and the topics we've just been discussing, we have one more exercise in your study guide. In this exercise, you were asked to read several sentences and for each one to decide whether it was a simple sentence, a compound sentence, a complex sentence, or a compound complex sentence. In addition, we threw in one run-on sentence for you to notice. Remember that a run-on sentence is an error, something you would need to correct if you uh, wrote one in your own writing. Let's take a look at the first sentence in the exercise. Jazz is the greatest American musical form, and Duke Ellington is its greatest genius. Here we have two clauses, and both are independent clauses. Either of these could stand alone as a sentence. Jazz is the greatest American musical form. That could stand alone as a sentence. Duke Ellington is its greatest genius. That, too, could stand alone as an independent sentence. Therefore, we have two independent clauses which have been properly and correctly combined by using a comma and the word and. Therefore, we have a compound sentence in this case. Let's look at our second example. Although young women want to participate in sports as much as young men, women's sports often don't receive equal funding from colleges. Here we have a slightly longer sentence, but it's still fundamentally not too complicated. It really consists of just two clauses. Let's break it down into parts and analyze each one. The first clause is everything before the comma, and it reads, although young women want to participate in sports as much as young men. What's the verb in this particular clause? What word expresses action or being on the part of the subject? The verb is want, and the subject is women. Young women is the broader subject, but the si simple subject is women. So the subject and verb in this clause is women want, and everything else in the clause is there to provide kind more women we're talking about and what specifically they want. Now, looking at that clause as a whole, could it stand alone as a sentence? The answer is no, 
it's a subordinate clause. It couldn't stand alone as a sentence. And again, there's a telltale sign. It begins with the subordinating conjunction, although. When you read this clause, you can see that something more is needed to make a complete thought. Although young women want to participate in sports as much as young men, therefore what? We don't know, and so by itself, this would not work as a complete sentence. Notice that although there are a lot of words there, it would still make a sentence fragment. So the word fragment doesn't necessarily mean a short or small number of words. It simply means that the, uh, the words do not express a complete thought and therefore cannot stand alone as a sentence. So we have here a subordinate clause in the first part of this sentence. What about the second part of the sentence? Women's sports often don't receive equal funding from colleges. Here we have an independent clause. This could stand alone as a complete sentence. Uh, don't receive is the verb, and sports, or women's sports, more broadly, is the subject. This could stand alone as a sentence, so it's an independent clause. So we have here a subordinate clause linked to an independent clause. The two ideas together make one complete thought, and therefore we have a complex sentence. Our third example reads, the tallest mountain in Africa, Mount Kilimanjaro, is the subject of a stunning new IMAX documentary film. Now, the first group of words in this sentence doesn't happen to be a clause. The sentence begins, the tallest mountain in Africa. Remember that a clause has to contain both a subject and a verb. Is there a verb here, a word expressing action or being? Not really. Uh, we simply have a, a, what could be a subject, the tallest mountain in Africa, but there's no verb there. So this is not a clause. It's a, it's a modifying phrase, a, again, a term that's not important for this conversation, but it's simply giving more information about what appears in the real clause, which is about to begin. Mount Kilimanjaro is the subject of a stunning new IMAX documentary film. Here is where the verb appears. Is is the verb, and the simple subject is Mount Kilimanjaro. So in this case, this sentence consists of simply one clause, one independent clause, which is able to stand alone as a sentence. So this is a simple sentence. Again, notice the term simple sentence doesn't necessarily mean that the sentence is very short. There are quite a few words here, but because there's only one clause, it's a simple sentence. Our next example. The author Mark Twain was fascinated by technology. He was the first writer ever to deliver a typed manuscript to his publisher. Here we have two separate clauses, and both of them happen to be independent clauses. Either one could stand alone as a sentence. You can probably tell just by reading them. The author Mark Twain was fascinated by technology. We have a subject and a verb, and this could stand alone as a complete thought. He was the first writer ever to deliver a typed manuscript to his publisher. Here again, we have a subject and a verb, and it could stand alone as a complete thought. We have two independent clauses then. Does that mean we have a compound sentence? No, because the rules for how you create a compound sentence have not been followed. The two independent clauses have simply been stuck together with a comma. So what do we have? We have a run-on sentence, and this is an error. It would have to be corrected either by adding a coordinating conjunction, uh, such as and or, or but, or by substituting a semicolon for the comma in the middle of the sentence. In this case, using a semicolon would probably make the most sense, since and or or uh, but do not work particularly well as connecting words in this sentence. Instead, using a semicolon to turn this into a proper compound sentence would be a good way of correcting the run-on sentence. It would then read, the author Mark Twain was fascinated by technology, semicolon. He was the first writer ever to deliver a typed manuscript to his publisher. And that would be correct. Our last sentence reads, when I visited California last summer, I spent one week in San Francisco, and I visited the nearby Napa Valley with my cousin. Here we have three clauses. The first one, when I visited California last summer, is a subordinate clause. Perhaps you can tell that it can't stand alone as a sentence. It leaves us wondering what happened. 
when I visited California last summer. It sounds incomplete, and it is. It is a subordinate clause and can't stand alone as a sentence. The next clause reads, I spent one week in San Francisco. This is an independent clause. It could stand alone as a sentence. The last clause reads, I visited the nearby Napa Valley with my cousin. Again, it's another independent clause, and it could also stand alone as a sentence. So in this case, we have a subordinate clause followed by two independent clauses. What kind of sentence does this make? A compound complex sentence. So this shows exactly how these different types of sentences work. And I think you can see that combining independent with subordinate clauses in various ways gives you the flexibility to bring together in a single sentence ideas that are related to one another or that belong together and that add up to a complete whole. And the more practice you have in writing in English, the better you'll get at using each of these four different types of sentences appropriately in order to express increasingly complex ideas. Well, that concludes our discussion of sentence structure. You've learned about the basic parts of any sentence, about the most common types of sentences, and you've also learned about the errors that you need to avoid when constructing a sentence properly in order to earn high grades on papers that you might write for school, as well as to express yourself effectively and uh, correctly in any writing that you do on the job or in any other life situation. I hope you found this program to be helpful, and you're invited to view the other programs in Video Aided Instructions English Grammar Series in order to further strengthen your comfort level with the complexities of English grammar. Thank you for watching, and good luck in your future endeavors.